Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Gamanji, and currently I am a senior field engineer at Apple. I joined Apple last year, and in this role, I am trying to bring Kubernetes and cloud native expertise to different products and services within Apple. As well, I am one of the TOC or Technical Oversight Committee member for CNCF or Cloud Native Computing Foundation. In this role, I am joining 10 other champions within the industry, and we try to provide a technical vision for the CNCF landscape. I have many other roles in the community, one of them being on the advisory board for Captain, which currently is an incubating CNCF project, and I am the creator of the Cloud Native Fundamentals course. So this is actually a free course that you can find on Udacity, but if you have anyone interested in pursuing a, a Cloud Native job, I definitely recommend looking at this course as well. Today, however, I would like to talk about Bare Metal Chronicles, and more specifically, the intertwinement between Cluster API Tinkerbell and GitOps. And to do so, firstly, I would like to introduce Cluster API. And this is pretty much we're going to look into a tool that provides a set of interfaces and standards to provision our infrastructure to different cloud providers. Next, I'm going to focus on bare metal provisioning. And here I'm going to introduce a tool which is called Tinkerbell. Now, more importantly, I'm going to focus on the combination between Cluster API and Tinkerbell. And this is going to be the KPT, or Cluster API provider for Tinkerbell. And lastly, to introduce some automation in all of this architecture, I would like to look into tools such as GitOps, uh, such as Argo CD and Flux, and where we can further introduce automation and parameterization in our infrastructure. Now, before I move forward, how many of you here are familiar with Cluster API? Have you heard about it, using it in production maybe? Okay, some hands. How many of you have heard about Tinkerbell and know the character? Okay, one hand. <laughs> and how many of you have heard about GitOps, Argo City Flux, using it in production? Okay, that's really good. Awesome. And how many of you are actually using bare metal or have on-prem data centers that you have to manage? Okay, some of you. I hope by the end of this talk, you're going to be more inspired to actually look into bare metal provisioning because it's not that scary as it might seem. Now, there is a reason why I'm giving this talk at this moment. Now, actually, just kind of a TLDR, not TLDR, um, um, kind of a note. I do realize that the screens might not be very visible, so I'll just try to go for everything very slowly to ensure that everyone has an understanding of what's going on. So if, if you don't understand something, please let me know and I'll go for it uh, one more time. Now, going back to the thread of the story, there is a reason why I'm giving this talk at this moment, because within the cloud native landscape, we had multiple tools that cross the chasm. Now, crossing the chasm means that we're going to have late adopters, and these late adopters are described by the fact that they're very restricted and they should have a full ownership of their infrastructure. As such, they look into solutionizing how they can deploy and manage Kubernetes on bare metal. However, the story was a bit different at the beginning. To actually reach the point where we need to solve this, this problem, we need to look a bit uh, into the past, more exactly nine years ago. Now, if you look nine years ago, the container orchestrator framework space was very heavily diversified. We had tools such as Docker Swarm, Apache Mesos, CoreOS Fleet, Kubernetes, and all of them provided a viable solution to run containers at scale. However, Kubernetes it took the lead in defining the principles of how to run containerized workloads. Nowadays, Kubernetes is known for its portability and adaptability, but more importantly for its approach towards declarative configuration and automation. And we can see this in numbers as well. Based on the VMware Tons report, State of Kubernetes, 99% of the organizations see a clear benefit of using Kubernetes. The first one being a better resource utilization, so CPU and memory, and the second one being an eased application management, especially when you want to upgrade your application in the cluster. Now, a metric which is going to be very important for this talk is that 52% of the organization still have a need to deploy their infrastructure on-prem. Very important. This number is actually declining from last year. Last year it was 55%, this year is 52 So we see a slow decline in the need for bare metal. But that does not dismiss the fact that half of this organization still need to deploy on-prem, so they need a solution for that. And another metric I would like to draw your attention to is, is that 88% of the organizations manage more than six clusters. Now, the story here is that it's very complicated and difficult to actually provision one cluster, but once you do it one time, you can easily replicate that across different environments. So you can have, for example, QA, staging, 
production and many more. And this actually grows exponentially if you need to deploy to different availability zones. So you replicate your stacks across the world. However, the community and the adoption rate for Kubernetes increased, and this was very beneficial for it because over time, multiple tools were built around it to extend its functionalities. And we actually saw some of these um, interfaces that we talked in the morning, such as support for different networking, runtime, storage, and many more. And this created what today we know as the cloud native landscape, which resides under the CNCF umbrella. And this is the landscape that we, the TOC, provide a technical vision for. So we will try to pretty much accept projects within the sandbox level, and we will pretty much help them to go through incubation and graduation status. So the aim is for all of these projects to reach a maturity and the graduation stage. Now, at this stage, we know that Kubernetes is pluggable. It is extensible. However, at the moment when we had interoperability at the basis, we had multiple tools that were built to bootstrap a cluster as well. So you might be familiar with tools such as KubeADM, Copspray, Tectonic Installer, if you go back to the CoreOS house, um, and many more actually. However, if you look at all of these tools, it's difficult to find a common denominator. What it means is that if I use one tool to deploy my infrastructure to Azure, it's going to be very difficult for me to use the same tool to deploy my infrastructure to GCP. Usually I have to introduce a new tool, and this is not sustainable, especially if you have a multi-fleet strategy for your clusters. As such, it was clear that we need standardization and interfaces. And this is where Cluster API was introduced. So Cluster API is a set of declarative APIs for cluster creation, management, and deletion. But more importantly, it does so in a unified manner across multiple cloud providers. Now, when we refer to Cluster API, we refer to C Cluster Lifecycle, which had its first initial release in April 2019. Since then, it had multiple releases, and this year, it reached the V1 Beta 1 endpoint, a very big milestone for the Cluster API team. And as I mentioned, it actually integrates actively with multiple cloud providers. So we're going to have support for major cloud providers, such as AWS, GCP, and Azure. We're going to have support for Chinese providers as well, such as Alibaba Cloud, Baidu, and Tencent. And if you deploy your infrastructure to China, you would know it's quite challenging because usually you cannot lift and shift. You actually have to use tooling inside that region. Well, with Cluster API, at least the way you deploy your infrastructure is going to be similar and standardized. And lately, we have new initiatives to bootstrap our clusters on bare metal. And this initiative is led by Packet, Metal Free, and Tinkerbell. Now, I've seen a lot of people being new to Cluster API, so what I'm going to do, I'll just try to introduce it to make sure that we have the base understanding and fundamental knowledge to know how it works. So let's suppose we would like to deploy multiple clusters in different, different cloud providers and different regions. The first thing we're going to need is a Kubernetes cluster. So we need a Kubernetes cluster to deploy multiple Kubernetes clusters. This is something that I call Kubeception. Now for testing purposes, you can use Kind, which is pretty much a Dockerized version for, your, for Kubernetes, to create this management cluster. If you want to use Cluster API in production, I do recommend using a fully fledged cluster, and this is because it comes with a more sophisticated failing over strategy. Now, once we have our management cluster up and running, we'll require the dependencies or the controller managers on, installed on top of it. And currently, there are three types of controller managers we need to look into the Cluster API CRDs, or Customer Source Definition Controller, the Bootstrap Provider Controller, and the Infrastructure Provider Controller. Let's go back to the first one. Cluster API introduces five new Customer Source Definition, and we need a controller to make sure that we can create, delete, or reconcile any changes we have to these resources. The second one is going to be the Bootstrap Provider, and this is the component that translates the YAML, in it, YAML script into Cloud init script, and it will make sure to attach an instance from a cloud provider to the cluster as a node. And this capability currently is provisioned by KubeADM, Talus, and EKS. And the last component we're going to need is the infrastructure provider. And this is going to be the component that talks with the provider APIs and produces the actual resources. Think about instances, VPCs, subnets, security groups, and so forth. So the actual, like, actual resources. Now here with the infrastructure provider is that the relationship is one to many. You need at least one provider. So if you deploy your infrastructure to GCP, you will need the infrastructure provider for GCP. If you want to deploy to Tinkerbell, you will need the Tinkerbell provider and so forth. So it depends on what kind of providers you want to deploy your infrastructure. So once we have our controllers installed, we will be able to provision the target clusters. 
and the target clusters are the one we will be delivering to our application teams so they can put their, uh, their services on top of. And these are going to be the clusters that your customers will interact with while consuming your services. Now, a very important concept that Cluster API introduces is cluster as a resource. Pretty much we'll be able to use YAML manifest to define our infrastructure as code. And this can be done for the five customer source definitions or CRDs that I mentioned. And I'm going to introduce them um, shortly because they're going to be quite relevant for the demo. Hopefully the demo is going to work as well. Now, the first resource we're going to look into is a cluster resource. And this takes care of the main networking components for a cluster. So think about the subnets for your pods and services or DNS suffix and so forth. Now, by default in cluster API, you're going to have a control plane associated with every single cluster. So a control plane resource pretty much allows you to programmatically manage multiple machines with a control plane label, label which is going to have all of the control plane components installed on top of it. Machine here, you can think this is a resource that's very similar to instance. So here you can actually um, check or actually specify the version of Kubernetes, the instance type, any security groups, networking, and so forth. So this is going to be the vanilla provisioning for cluster API. You're just going to have a couple of control planes. That's it, control plane machines. Now, if you'd like to deploy any workloads, you need a data plane. And in cluster API, this is managed through a machine deployment. So I'm hoping that you're familiar with Kubernetes. So machine deployment is very similar to deployment. It will roll out strategies between different machine set resources. Machine set, very similar to replica set. It will ensure that we have an amount of machine resources up and running at all time. And machine, again, this is just an instance. We can specify the version of Kubernetes, instance type, and so forth. However, the label on these particular instances are going to be worker node. Now, these five customer source definitions, we can use to specify our infrastructure as code. So we don't need to use Ansible or Terraform. We can use our YAML. We like YAML within Cloud Native. So here is where we can say that I want a cluster with 10 nodes, three of them being the control plane, seven of them being in the data plane. I would like this cluster to be deployed in GCP, for example, in this particular region with these particular security groups attached to it. So here's where we define what we want for our infrastructure. And to kind of provide more of a visual aid of how exactly cluster resource uh, looks like, here I have a cluster resource for AWS, and I'm going to showcase it for GCP and Tinkerbell as well. Now, what I have here is a cluster resource with the name demo cluster in the V1 beta 1 endpoint. In the spec section, I'm choosing a slash 16 for our pods. And towards the end, you can see that we have a control plane reference attached to it. So this is going to be by default with every single cluster resource. However, I would like to draw your attention towards the infrastructure reference. Here is where we say that we want this cluster to be deployed in AWS. And what's going to happen underneath, it's going to pull configuration that's very specific to AWS, and we define actually. So here we say that we want the cluster to be deployed in your central one as a region, and we want to attach an SSH key name with the name default to our instances. This is not a declarative list of variables. You have a full flexibility of what you can configure, but these are just for demo purposes here. Now, very important, pay attention. If we want to deploy the same cluster to GCP, these are going to be the changes required. So on the cluster side, we just change our infrastructure reference. That's the only thing we need to do. And underneath is going to pull all of the configuration that we defined for GCP. As such, the region naming convention is very different. We deploy it to Europe West 3. We have the concept of a project within GCP. So we attach our cluster to a project called CAPI, and we can specify the network. In this case, with the name default CAPI. But more, more importantly, what you can see here, we have standardization. We can use and reuse our manifest. We have the building blocks. What's going to be different is the configuration for the cloud provider. And if you'd like to deploy our cluster using Tinkerbell, again, infrastructure reference is going to point to a Tinkerbell cluster. However, the configuration is going to be very specific for Tinkerbell. And here I'm just specifying the base registry where we'd like to pull our infrastructure or uh, images to be installed on our bare metal. Now, so far with Cluster API, we know that we can deploy our infrastructure anywhere and we can do so in a standardized manner. So we have building blocks and interfaces, open spec. Now what happens if as an organization, you do not want to use a cloud provider? What happens if you want to fully manage your infrastructure on bare metal? Well, in this case, we have Tinkerbell that saves the day. 
Tinkerbell is an engine for bare metal provisioning anywhere. Kubernetes is just a subset of it. It pretty much provisions bare metal anywhere. It was built by the Equinix Metal team in 2019, and it was donated to CNCF as a sandbox project in November 2020. Now, being a sandbox project means it's a still greenfield project. It still requires a lot of enhancements when it comes to functionalities. So it's no, not at the production level or at the scale that every single organization needs. But this is where I would like to invite you to contribute and actually look into the tool, especially if you have a need for bare metal. And of course, Tinkerbell aims to minimize the time for provisioning bare metal anywhere. So it can be pretty much data centers, public cloud, or even edge devices. So now let's look at how Tinkerbell works. So to manage any bare metal using Tinkerbell, you need three sets of configurations. Let me try to show that. <laughs> three sets of configuration, hardware, template, and workflow. The hardware is going to be your inventory. So for example, I have 10 Raspberry Pi machines, or I have this amount of servers available. You need to declaratively actually specify that. And you can uniquely identify every single hardware machine using the MAC address and the IP address. After the inventory specification, we need a template. And a template is pretty much a set of actions that we want to perform on top of the bare metal. So think about this. You want to inst install an operating system. You want to install dependencies, any middleware, any applications. So by the end of it, you have a server in the state that you want it in production. And workflow is pretty much attaching a hardware to a template. And this is very useful, especially if you have a multi-fleet strategy. So you can say, I want five machines to be installed with Linux and their respective dependencies, and the other five machines to have Windows and their respective dependencies. So you can have this strategy of how you want to provision your bare metal. Now, once we have all of this configuration available, we can use the Tink CLI and send all of this configuration to the Tink server. The Tink server pretty much can be running anywhere within your environment or local machine if you're doing a demo. And what is it actually gonna do? If you have a hardware and a template, it's going to take a machine, run all the actions in the template, so by the end, you should have a server in the desired state that you wanted. Now, as I mentioned, Tinkerbell focuses on bare metal provisioning anywhere. What happens if I want to provision Kubernetes on bare metal? Or what happens if I want a machine or a bare metal machine to be attached to the cluster as a node? In this case, we have the combination between cluster API and Tinkerbell coming together. And this is going to be crowned by KPT or Cluster API Provider for Tinkerbell. And this is actually how it's going to look like. Quite overwhelming, but I'm going to take it step by step. We need to look at three sets of configuration. What we need from the Tinkerbell side, what we need from the management cluster on the Cluster API, and what's going to result. The result is going to be the target cluster. So going back to Tinkerbell side, here's where we need all of our configuration. Like as I mentioned, we need three sets of configuration. Workflow, templates, uh, actually hardware, templates, and workflow. You can actually see them already in this diagram. So on the Tinkerbell side, we need our inventory. We need to say that we have 10 Raspberry Pi machines, and we need to make Tink server aware of them. From the management cluster side, this is going to be cluster API, a mini recap. What we need is all of our controllers, so dependencies. We need the infrastructure provider for Tinkerbell. So KPT is going to be installed by default. Another thing we're going to need here is the YAML configuration for our infrastructure. So as I mentioned, we use YAML or CRDs to define our infrastructure's code. We need that. We need to define that we want a cluster with five nodes and so forth. And another thing we're going to have is a hardware YAML. Now, this is the important distinction because if we have 10 Raspberry Pi machines, you might want only five of them to be part of the cluster. So you need to make Cluster API aware of what it actually can use throughout the bootstrapping process. So the hardware YAML is going to contain, for example, five or six machines that you want to dedicate for your infrastructure. Now, the very important thing about Cluster or Tinkerbell and the Tinkerbell provider for Cluster API, it actually comes with a set of templates and workflows available. So you don't have to rewrite them. They're already available out there. So what's actually going to do is if you want to provision a new machine, a bare metal machine using KPT, the template is going to have the actions to install all of the Kubernetes binaries. So you're going to have the kubelet, you're going to have the certs installed, you're going to have kube proxy networking attached. So by the end of it, you should have an instance with all the Kubernetes binaries that will be able to be attached to the control plane and actually be part of the cluster in the target cluster. Cool. It's a bit packed, but let's take a breather. Now, 
I would like to take you back to the beginning of the presentation, where we've seen that 88% of the organization manage more than six clusters. It is impossible to manage these clusters individually, at least sustainably. So what you need to do is you need to introduce automation and parameterization if possible. And here is where we can actually use the power of GitOps. Now, most of you are familiar with GitOps. Just kind of a very quick recap. The GitOps principle has the Git repositories as the source of truth for defining the state of your application, and in our case, our infrastructure. Now, what it's actually going to mean is by default, we're going to have a PR-based rollout. That means that the delta between our local environment and production is just one PR away. GitOps actually brings automatic reconciliation as a very important capability. And what it actually means is that we're going to have a GitOps tool that's going to watch a repository, and if new changes are identified, these are going to be extrapolated and applied to the cluster straight away. But more importantly, with GitOps, we're going to have a version state of our cluster. This means we have different historical data points of our infrastructure. So if you are in a red state, for example, you can very easily revert to a known and green state using just a couple of Git commands. Now, this is actually a very nice announcement. I think everyone are is aware. But the GitOps principle is very well represented by Argo City and Flux, and both of which graduated within the last week. So this is a very important milestone for the cloud native community. Argo CD actually announced their graduation yesterday, and Flux uh, announced their graduation, I think, a couple of days ago. But meaning, uh, actually being a graduate project means that you have a big, um, a very mature project that has a lot of adoptions and contributions from different organizations. But more importantly, it has a sustainable roadmap with functionalities that actually can solve the problems that the tools will, will need to solve in the future. And with that, let's actually see where we can use or where we can introduce automation within our infrastructure provisioning. Now, what I've done for now is I've completely removed Tinkerbell from the scenario because Cluster API um, pretty much standardizes the way we deploy our infrastructure anywhere, even with using Tinkerbell or even on bare metal. So what I'm actually going to focus here is how can we automate our infrastructure provisioning using Cluster API and Argo CD. So going back to the fundamentals, we're going to look at everything we can have or should have on the management cluster, and the result is going to be applied to the target cluster. Now, on the management cluster, we're going to have, again, mini recap, we're going to have all of our controllers up and running. As well, we're going to have our infrastructure as code. So what kind of infrastructure cluster we would like to deploy? Now, all of these YAML manifests, by default, they can be stored in Git. And by default, we can use a tool such as Argo CD to watch these manifests. So if you introduce any new changes to your Git uh, to actual manifest in Git, you can merge your PR. Argo CD is going to pick up the changes from the PR and apply them to the target cluster straight away. Very optional, however, I, I want to sort of kind of outline this. You can use a template manager. Because we have multiple clusters, we want to parameterize or we want to reuse as much of our infrastructure as possible. So here, for example, I'm introducing help. You can use customize as well to parameterize the version of Kubernetes to 1.24, to parameterize the amount of replica for the control plane, in this case, to three, and the replicas for the worker nodes. In this case, it's going to be one. So here we have pretty much a cluster with four nodes in version 1.4, 124.0. Now, any changes now I need to introduce are going to be to the Helm chart because Argo CD is going to watch the Helm chart. If I'm putting any changes to this chart, for example, putting a different version for Kubernetes 1.25, for example, these changes are going to be picked up by Argo CD and applied to the target cluster straight away. And this is something that I would like to demo as well, if I'm not mistaken. So going here, what I'm going to showcase the setup I'm having at the moment. I have the management cluster deployed on my local machine using Kind. On this cluster, I have all of the controllers installed. Actually, I'm going to use AWS, a very important remark here. I would love to do the demo on bare metal. However, to travel with a bit of Raspberry Pis across the world, it's more challenging. So I'm going to use AWS because it's more convenient for me to showcase how we can automate our infrastructure provisioning. But it doesn't matter because with Cluster API, the functionality is going to be similar. So ideally, you should have a digestible understanding of how we can automate and provision our infrastructure. So in this case, the controllers that I'm going to have is going to be for AWS as well. Argo CD is going to be installed and I'm going to have a Helm chart that's going to manage my infrastructure. And the idea is that I'm going to increase the amount of replica nodes for uh, actually the worker nodes. And ideally, they should be applied to the target cluster without me doing anything. 
So without any further ado, cool. let's just make sure that everything works. Now, this is a bit overwhelming. I know these screens are a bit small, so not, it's not very readable all the way through. However, I'm going to take you all the way step by step to showcase what I actually have um, happening on the screens. So, that, oh, that's not it either. <laughs> cool. What I'm actually going to do, this is my management cluster. I'm going to get all of my pods. So I would like to showcase all of the controllers that I have installed. So this is a bit overwhelming. I don't like the viewing. It's a bit trimmed, but if I make it smaller, no one can see it either. So I'm going to point your attention towards the um, cluster API. This is going to be the bootstrap provider. So in this case, I'm using kubeadm to bootstrap my cluster. The, yeah, and this is going to be for the control plane. We needed a, uh, a control controller for our CRDs, and this is going to be installed in the CAPI system. So this is going to take care of our CRD reconciliation. And as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have an infrastructure provider. And in this case, it's going to be called Kappa. We know about KPT, which is provider for Tinkerbell. Kappa is provider for AWS. So cluster API provider for AWS. Because I'm using AWS, I have that controller installed. And as well, you can see that I have Argo CD already installed over here. So pretty much we'll be able to connect to Argo CD as well. Now, here is where I would like to showcase how we have the management cluster versus target cluster. So on the top, I have the management cluster. On the bottom, I have the target cluster. So this is a cluster you're actually gonna provision. Now, because in AWS, the VPC provisioning takes around five minutes, I've already provisioned the target cluster. So just kind of be um, more resourceful with the time. But what I have here, I'm actually getting all the machines. So the machines are our CRDs. These are all our instances. And we can see we have currently, I'm just going to try to highlight them. You see here, control plane, control plane, control plane. We have three control plane machines. And you can actually see in our target cluster that we have three control plane machines as well. And here on the management cluster side, we can see that we have one worker node. This is, well, this is like insider knowledge, but MD here stands for machine deployment, which is pretty much our data plane. And we can see that here we have one worker node as well. So pretty much what we have in our machines matches the target cluster as well. The change I would like to introduce is pretty much um, increase the amount of replicas that we have for our cluster. Now, before I do that, some people might be new to, to Helm chart or actually how we parameterize some of our variables. So here is the Helm chart or the input file for the Helm chart um, that I've actually showcased on the slides. So pretty much it's similar. Again, we parameterize the version of, let me make this bigger a bit. We parameterize the version of Kubernetes to 124, three replica nodes for our control plane and one replica node for our worker, uh, worker plane or data plane. So everything matches that we have in our terminal. Now to showcase, actually, uh, to showcase how Helm chart works, I would like to showcase Let's see, the template. I'm gonna to go to the cluster template. And here, again, everything we've seen on the slides pretty much is the same. So we have a cluster resource. We choose a slash 16 for our pods and our infrastructure reference is AWS. So here is where we pretty much say that we want this cluster to be deployed in AWS. To see where the template, like where the Helm chart will input variables, uh, let's go to machine deployment. And here is actually where you're going to pick up the amount of replicas for our worker nodes. And here's how we're going to pick up the version of Kubernetes. So this is just a way for Helm to pretty much pull up the values that we have in, in the input file and recreate the manifest with the desired state that we want. Actually, one more minute. Hopefully, if you give me maybe two more minutes, I'm going to showcase the demo if everyone is patient enough. Um, but I'll try to go through this as quickly as possible. So what I'm actually going to do, the only thing I'm going to do is change our values that demo file that we've seen on the slides. And I'm going to increase the amount of replicas from one to, let's put five. Because it's GitOps, all I need to do is to use Git commands to submit my changes. So I'm going to use a Git commit with a, a very meaningful demo message. I'm going to submit all my files and I'm going to do a Git push straight away. I know we're over time, but I really want to showcase this and how it's actually going to work. Cool. Now, what we actually can do, we can look into Argo City. 
This is going to be very overwhelming, but this is how we can see a visualization of all of our parameters and customer service definitions. So what I'm going to do, uh, it's actually going to look for the repository every single couple of minutes, but I can reinforce to look for new changes. So if I hit a refresh, and hopefully my internet is not going to fail me. <laughs> oh, goodness mine. This is peer pressure. Let's see. Am I actually... Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, let me just do the port forward again. Local demos, cool. Okay, refresh. Refreshing. <laughs> awesome. And we can see that we are out of sync. Ideally, we should see our change here. We increase the amount of replicas from one to five. Now, with Argo CD, you can do automatic reconciliation. I chose to do manual reconciliation just because I would like to kick off the demo. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to synchronize manually, but this can be fully automated with Argo CD. And ideally, we can see that we have some resources showing up here, but more importantly, we should be able to see them here. On the management cluster, we can already provision some of our machines. And ideally, by the end of it, hopefully, I mean, we're not going to have time to see this, but within a minute or so, we'll be able to see new machines added to the cluster. So I can come back to this after um, I'm introducing one of the last slides. Oh, peer pressure. <laughs> cool. I'll come back to that. I really want to showcase how that's going to happen. It's usually around the minute. So shall I actually stop now? Is that it? I don't have time. Cool. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to actually showcase the demo or another slide I wanted to showcase is how we can combine all of these tools together. So how we can use Tinkerbell, Cluster API, and Argo CD to deploy our infrastructure in an automatic way. Now, I don't have any more slides. This is the overlap between the tools. But more importantly, I would like to thank you very much. If you have any questions and if you'd like to see the demo, there it's actually a recording of it, so you'll be able to see it. Um, I'm more than happy to show it after the talk as well. So like, if you want to really see it, I'm happy to showcase, the, showcase it after. If you have any questions, reach out to me on social media, such as Twitter and LinkedIn. And this is a QR code towards the Cloud Native Fundamentals course. So if everyone would like to start their career in Cloud Native, I recommend taking this course. Now, this is Katie Gomanji, and I look forward to seeing how you can shape the cloud native ecosystem. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. And we have, we have new machines here 49 seconds ago. Here it is. The demo worked, actually, but not in time. <laughs>